It's time to start. Good morning, everyone. As you can see, I'm not Pastor Hugh, <laughs> but I am taller, thanks to Brad, who put a little platform here, and so, so I can stand a little taller. So, um, Anyhow, for our announcements this morning, um, Pastor Hugh is on vacation. Rob Needham will be uh, giving the sermon today, and various other people will be taking part. And as you can see, there's no prayer and Bible study on Tuesday. And uh, those that have signed up for True Scripts, I guess you need to be working on those. Uh, the ministry schedules are due June 28th. If you'd like to volunteer, you know, like for the nursery or someplace like that, well, be sure and contact the church. Um, the sermons are on the internet. Just the sermons, as we're not allowed to put anything else on. So next Sunday, deacons meeting. Um, any other announcements? Tuesday for you boys and girls, there's a hay rack ride and uh, water sand and stuff, um, crafts down at our house, clear down below in the sand. This is the civic, civic uh, program the civic group in, in town uh, puts this on, and Robin Ferris and I do it. So that'll be at our house down below on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. Okay, does anyone else have an announcement? Good morning. How is everybody? Man, I'm standing tall. I like it. <laughs> you know, I, Rob asked me this morning if I'd read scripture, and I said, well, what would you like me to read? And he said, Psalm 78, 1 through 8. I can't think of a better scripture to read on Father's Day. God in his sovereignty, for reasons we do not fully understand, chose fathers to instruct their children and to pass this down from generation to generation to generation. So, Rob, my hat's off to you. It's perfect scripture for Father's Day. Read along with me now as I read from Psalm 78, 1 through 8. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord, and his might, and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Well, the only talking I ever do is to a wanna kids or to high schoolers, so you all are intimidating. I work all day with about 128 inmates, and I'll tell you what, I'm probably more nervous now than I am dealing with any of them, so <laughs> we'll see how this goes. You guys all see that one grill? I think that's what I want for Father's Day, Shelley, with the huge, the chrome thing. Well, in case you didn't know, today is the 100th anniversary of Father's Day. So, you know, when Hugh first asked me to speak, I didn't even know it was Father's Day. You know, oh, it's just a couple weeks away, oh, no problem. Then I looked, and it's Father's Day. Then I find out after, a few days after that, that it's the 100th anniversary of Father's Day. So suddenly I'm like, oh, all this pressure. I have to do something <laughs> good. But you're kind of stuck with what you got, so. Um, does anybody ever remember, and probably those my age and younger probably don't, the Rube Goldberg machines? 
Rube Goldberg. Let me see if I can find my little clicker. There it is. Well, anybody remember Foghorn Leghorn? That big rooster. You know? <laughs> and he routinely would take care of Prissy, that little hen, son. Remember that? And then he'd inevitably do something to this kid because he really didn't like the kid too much. And then between him getting after the dog and the kid getting back at Foghorn Leghorn, he'd invent these massive machines where a bowling ball would roll down this thing and knock over this, which would knock over a telephone pole, which would light a candle, which would blow this, and eventually a dynamite would blow up and Foghorn always ended up on a losing end of it. Well, a Rube Goldberg machine, well, here's an example of one. This is the mosquito bite scratcher. <laughs> See, over here, you have a drain pipe, and you have water flowing out of the drain pipe. That, of course, causes the needle that's on a flotation device in the tube to rise, which bursts the paper or the sack, filled with alcohol, of course, which gets the bird intoxicated, which falls off, hits the spring, landing on the platform, which then it sees the string, thinks it's a worm, obviously, so it pecks at it, which then fires a cannon underneath the board, which makes the dog get scared, flip over, and fall unconscious, and it's breathing, then rises and lowers the lever which scratches a mosquito bike on the back of the guy's neck so he can carry on the conversation with a woman without missing a beat. <laughs> you know, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, I think everybody should have one of these. What makes a Rube Goldberg machine a Rube Goldberg machine is what's called irreducible complexity. That means you can't take anything away from this or the whole thing would lose its function. If you take away the bird, the string doesn't get pulled, the cannon doesn't get fired, the dog doesn't flip, the thing doesn't go up and down. If you take away any aspect, take away the water, it doesn't rise, it doesn't get the bird intoxicated, the, not, not everything falls apart. So that's what irreducible complexity means, that you can't